Hello, everyone. Welcome to Budget 101 training for this evening. I'm just going to hold off on getting started for a minute or so just because we have some people who are actively entering the room. So I want them to be able to be here at the beginning of the session. And then we'll get started in just a minute. I want to thank you for being with us tonight. I know you probably had a long, busy day, so we appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to join us for this training. Okay, it's starting to slow down a little bit. So we will go ahead and get started. Um, I'll go over a little bit of the housekeeping like I do every week. Um, we have a Q&A box that you're um, able to use to ask us any questions that you want. Uh, we'll get to it either live in person and, and answer it for everyone, or we'll answer it just to you on the Q&A. Feel free to use the chat box to talk with each other. We have kind of a small group here as usual this evening. So it really is, um, you know, a, a laid back feel here with us at this training. We want to make sure that you're understanding the information. It will not bother us, bother us whatsoever. If you stop us um, to ask us questions, feel free to even use your icons to raise your hands in the corner of your screen so we can call on you and you can ask your question out loud if you would like. Um, tonight, we're covering Budget 101. This is part one, and it is based on the Dollars in Democracy, um, a guide to the state budget process by the California Budget and Policy Center. Uh, your presenter tonight is James Moses. You might be familiar with James. He is the regional director of the um, Child Care Resource Center in San Bernardino. He is also our lead advocate with ECE Voices in Region 10, which is Riverside, Inyo, Mono, and San Bernardino. And then I thought for fun tonight, we could get started with a poll. So I'll explain to you because we're gonna have a couple more of these throughout the evening. What you're gonna wanna do is send a text. So you send Justina E732 in a text to number 22333. And then you just answer A, B, or C. And I can put the instructions up here on the screen. Well, it's not really instructions. So you see at the top, you can either go to the website or you can send a text. So you text 22333 is the number that you text and you send Justina E732, it'll say, now you've joined the poll, and then you answer A, B, or C. So it's how familiar, familiar are you with the California budget process, what we're going to be talking about tonight. You're either very familiar, not very familiar, just a little bit. Go to the responses. All right, we've got a lot of responses here for not very familiar. So you're in the right place tonight to learn from, uh, from James. Um, I'm going to give him the heavy lifting tonight. So he's going to take over here and start teaching you all about the California budget process. So here we go. James, I'm going to pass it on over to you. Okay, well, thank you, Justine. I appreciate that. And uh, welcome, folks. We really appreciate you being here, learning more about, um, you know, both the legislative and the budget process. For the next two weeks, we'll be on the budget process. We really are hoping to continue to grow this EC Voices Network with a, a goal to get the, the practitioner's voice heard. So we're trying to uh, better equip them to be involved in advocacy and policy work. And uh, as we move forward, we'll look to create opportunities for them to not only voice their, um, have their voice heard locally, but also in Sacramento and even looking to have them do some, some work around hearings and such. So we'll get started with the budget here. I think one of the first things and, and most important things we want you to know is you don't have to be an expert um, on the budget, um, the, the budget process. There's really a lot of information out there. Organizations like Every Child California, we have the Budget and Policy Center, you know, CAPA, CAA, UIC. So there's a lot of organizations that you can get connected to that can really help you 
track budget issues, stay, stay apprised of what's happening in the budget, what the advocacy needs are, and how you can be involved. Um, and we'll talk more about that as, as we go. So the, the budget process, you know, when we really think about it, it's, it's a year long process, so to speak. The budget goes from, from July 1 to June 30th of each year, but there's really four uh, critical dates that we wanna make sure that you're aware of in, in the budget, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about these. Of these four dates here, Three of these are, are in the state constitution or really governed uh, for the, the state legislature and governor by state law. So the governor has to provide a January budget proposal for the upcoming fiscal year every year by January 10th. That's in our state constitution. Then the next major date is May 14th, and we'll talk in in upcoming slides about the process between January and May, but on May 14th, the governor must release a May revision each year. Now that's not governed by state constitution, that's governed by state law. The June 15th date is governed by state constitution, and uh, this is the date that the legislature must pass their budget bill and submit it to the governor by January 15th. I think it's me at midnight each year, January 15th. And um, if they don't do that, a law was passed quite a few years back. If they don't pass that budget by June 15th, then they are in danger of forfeiting their um, their income and their, their salary and, and travel funds. And then the, the final of those four date is June 30th. This traditionally, the governor uh, signs the budget bill for the next fiscal year by June 30th of each year. Although there's no statute requirement for this. And for some of you, if you've been around for, for many years uh, in our field or other fields, you'll, you'll know of times in the past where we went all the way till September, October, November before budgets were passed. And so then that would result in furloughs. It would result in uh, many smaller nonprofits having to go out of business temporarily and, and if they couldn't get the loans to, to float them until the, the budget went through. So those are the key dates that we, we wanna be aware of. Now, next we really think about um, the state constitution, you can go to the next slide, Justina, that kind of sets this uh, framework. And as I mentioned, part of this is state constitution and, and a little bit of it is also state state law. And California voters can revise these rules um, by providing uh, you know new new legislation, and then it's just a simple majority vote, and that would um, create an opportunity for them to change some some of these rules. So when we think about the state budget uh, process here, it's created every year. I, you know, those four dates we we, we gave you, this is, um, the, you know, those are the critical dates. But I think what's important to think about with the state budget, you know, it really it establishes a framework, but it's it shows our values. This is what our state values are. And um, it, it, you know, with this framework, it's really around public service systems. And this is why it's important for us to understand when and how we can advocate and have our voice heard because uh, much of this money, as you'll see, really comes down into the local economy. So legislators really have an interest in how this budget is created, how it's funded, because ultimately that's the money that comes into their local communities. So our voice is much more important in this than we often realize. So we want to voice our concerns so we can really show what California's pro uh, policy priorities are, what the public service systems need to really help children, families, and communities in, in our area. And then, um, you know, the next slide we'll kind of, in, in future slides, we'll go into more about kind of how that state budget breaks down. But we want to give you, uh, you know, a quick picture of the budget process. And what I will say is, you know, the budget process has changed a lot over the last um, several years. You know, you'll see on this slide, we talk about the big three, and that's the governor, the speaker of the Senate, uh, of the Assembly, and the Senate uh, pro tem. 
And several years ago, for those of you that have been around a while, you may remember us talking about the big five. The big five used to be a big part of the budget, and that's that's a change. So the big five, it was the same as the big three, but it added in also the Senate minority leader and the assembly minority leader. So that's where we got the big five. And then on the right side of this slide, and, and what I wanna say is the slides here, there's a lot of information on these slides. Um, and the purpose of that is so that when you go back and review, you really have in-depth information to really take a look at, glean from and learn from. Um, but this also outlines the, um, the conference committee. So, you know, the budget process starts with the departments really reviewing their plans for the upcoming year. The, um, they submit their, their budget proposals and budget analysis for their departments uh, up through the governor. But this is kind of coordinated with the Department of Finance as well. And so the Department of Finance also analyzes these department budgets. They work with the departments to prepare a balanced budget plan for the for the governor, right? And then uh, the governor has the opportunity to go through that, make some adjustments, and uh, he issues, you know, his um, state budget generally with, with the state of the state address, uh, no later as we mentioned than January tenth. So after January 10th, uh, essentially we go into this period. I said we'd talk a little bit more about this. So the budget comes out and really everybody and their brother takes a look at the, the, the governor's budget and really wants to weigh in. So at the state level, the, the LAO, the Legislative Analyst's Office, um, really does a lot of work on the budget and does a lot of analysis on the budget. And they provide that to the public. They also provide testimony within all of the Senate and Assembly uh, budget subcommittees to really talk about in those very specific areas like education, health. Um, they, they provide that budget analysis for those areas. In those budget subcommittee meetings that happen in that process, also the Department of Finance generally provides testimony, as well as the department. So if, if we're in the education subcommittee, it's the Department of Education. If we're in Health and Human Services, Department of Social Services is generally part of that. But they provide um, testimony. And this happens both in the Assembly and the Senate. So the Assembly and Senate both get this information, they weigh on it. What's been happening in recent years is the Assembly and the Senate have been doing a really good job of coming together. And often the, the Assembly and Senate have agreed upon a budget before they take it to the floor. So, so generally speaking, in, in years past, the Assembly would approve a version, the Senate would approve a version, and then they'd have to come together and iron out the differences of, of what they approved. But in, in more recent years, they've done a really good job of coming together, submitting one budget proposal that both the Assembly and Senate look at the very same budget proposal from the legislator. And then the, the adjustments that are made in each house that's really what the conference committee goes over and kind of irons that out. And then we have um, final approval in each floor. Um, and then that information goes back to the governor. Um, the governor analyzes that. The Department of Finance is involved. And that's that's when he comes up with his May revise. And then essentially we go through the same process. So the May revise comes out on May 14th. We essentially go through the same process, although very abbreviated because we have four months between January 10th and May 14th. So the, the January proposal has four months to have um, the analysis, have people weigh in, give input, make adjustments. But once that May revise comes on May 14th, the legislature, I mean, the governor has really just a matter of weeks to submit, you know, I mean, he submits that, submits it on May 14th, and then the legislature has four weeks. They have to 
analyze that may revise, take any input from the Department of Finance, the Legislative Analyst Office, each state department, and they have to come up with a final legislative budget proposal that's fully approved by both the Assembly and the Senate by June 15th. So they only have one month in that. And then that goes back to the governor and, um, and, and the governor, he has a few options. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, in, in upcoming slides. And so we're going to move to the next slide. We'll start to talk a little bit about um, California's budget and kind of how it's made up. So what we're looking at, you're going to see some numbers here if you're looking that close. These are numbers from our enacted 21-22 budget. So this was a couple of years ago. And um, really, you know, the state budget is a mix of funds, um, largely that come from the state general fund and the and federal drawdown dollars, federal funds. Generally speaking, year in and year out, the federal funds and the state general funds um, are they're pretty equal. They, they come in close together. They make up the vast majority of, of our budget. We'll go to the next slide and you'll see a little bit more kind of about where where funds go here, right? So um, the, the biggest investment for funds, and I mentioned this earlier, is in communities. And this is why it's so important for us to have our voice heard. This is why our state legislators are so interested in hearing from us. And this is why our voice at the local level is as important if not more important in many ways than having our voice heard in Sacramento, because, you know, more than 75% of the budget is found, you know, and goes to the local communities. So that's why it's super important that we have our voice heard at the local level. So we're going to go to the next slide and we'll break, break this down um, a little bit more, right? So, more than two thirds of the budget goes into budget areas that are extremely um, important to us and very closely related to the work that we do. So um, you'll see that, uh, you know, this talks about health and human services and then the education system, K through 12, higher education. So all almost all each year of the funding that comes down largely to our early childhood programming comes to us um, in these buckets. So the work that not only the direct work, but the work that supports us generally comes down in one of these three buckets. And so in that 21, 22 year of the $455 million budget, um, $257 billion was for health and human services and education. And as I said, this generally makes up um, somewhere between 60 and 60, 60 and 70 percent of our budget every year are in these three three areas. And we can um, go to the next slide. And here we're going to break down a little bit more about, you know, as I mentioned, our federal funds and our state general funds generally make up 85, 90% of our entire state budget. And the federal funds and the state general funds usually match pretty closely. They're, 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 they're not equal necessarily, but very close. But the vast majority of our federal funds support health and human services programs. And especially now, since most of our programs have moved from CDE to CDSS, most of our programs are found in this budget. And I just want to share, this is why it's really important for us to also think about federal funding, federal budgets, advocate with our federal elected officials as well, because so much funding comes down from the federal government and much of what does come down comes down into our uh, in, into areas that are funding our programs, our services, and the supports we need to be effective. Now, um, we and we have a couple of opportunities. I'm just going to throw this out. If you're down here where I'm at in the Southern California area, next Monday, November 20th, 
the California Department of Social Services is hosting a hearing for us to weigh in on the federal um, child care and development fund plan. So this is another opportunity where we can advocate for what our needs are related to this child care and development fund plan so that we ensure that our voice is heard in this plan, because ultimately over, over time, this plan is what's going to really guide the, how much money we get and how we use the money that we're going to get in the future. So we we want to we want to be attentive to that, and you know we can share more information about that. Uh, Justina, one thing I can't see anybody really on my screen, so I'm not I don't all know necessarily if we have uh, folks with questions, but I'm sure you'll stop me if we have any questions and. Yes, we did have one question and it was um, child care funding falls under where and I answered that it's mostly going to be under the health and human services, but also goes through education and um, feel free to, you know, explain that even more. But that's the one question we've had. Okay, yeah. So the and I mentioned this early, the vast majority of our funding comes through health and human services because we're funded under the California Department of Social Services. Um our state preschool funding, um, some of the quality money comes under CDE. And then of course, everything that's happening around UPK, the, the mixed delivery planning grants, the workforce development grants, those that funding all comes out of CDE as well. And it's important that we, we pay attention to that because many of those dollars are intended to be used for what we call the mixed delivery system, which I think there's still a lot of people who don't understand exactly what that means. But when we talk about the mixed delivery system, we're talking about the full uh, spectrum of early childhood providers that serve children and families, you know, from family friend and neighbor programs, family child care programs, private child care centers, faith-based centers, state preschools, Head Starts, TK programs, so, and if I missed any, it encompasses the ones I missed as well. So, you know, the idea is that it encompasses every uh, child care and development provider. So we need to be, um, we need to be attentive to that as well. And so we've talked about in, in previous slides, you know, we started this to say, you don't have to be an expert here. Um, there is a lot of information out there and, um, the, you know, the slide talks about the documents that are available. We make those available to you. So many of many of these are standard. They're standard links you can go to. And the, this information is posted in at these websites every year. Um, and especially connected to those dates, those four dates that we gave you. So one thing I will say, if you're not connected to Every Child California's email distribution list and our EC Voices distribution list, I encourage you to get connected both to both the Every Child California as well as EC Voices, because we make that information available to you on a regular and ongoing basis. So when the budget comes out, within 24 to 48 hours, the team at Every Child California, along with the public policy advisors, have have meetings and and analyze that state budget and generally like i said within 24 to 48 hours there is a budget summary that comes out from every child california those documents are available to you but also with links that'll take you to the governor's full budget the governor's budget summary if you want to go and read that information on your own um, you'll have access to the links to all of those documents and all that information so if you have time to read the 500 page budget, great. But if you don't, there's generally a two to four page budget summary by Every Child California. So those are all available to you. Um, and we uh, will be posting stuff. I think Justina will follow up with everyone that's on the call uh, tonight and you'll get information and with that within that information, all these links will be will be available to you. Okay. Let's go to the um, next one. So I'm going to try to go through this a little bit slowly so that it all makes sense, because we're going to break this down by the governor and the legislature. But I do want you to understand that all these things are intertwined. 
and they all happen um, in coordination. So they, 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 they overlap or they happen somewhat simultaneously. But we kind of want to walk you through from each of the, the governor and the legislature from their perspective, kind of what their process is. Right. So um, on the governor's side of things, you know, what's happening right now is departments are working on their budget proposals. So they're working on budget proposals. Um, I, I honestly do not know what date they have to submit those to the governor. But my my guess from conversations I've had is that they are already sharing their budget information with the governor's team and they're starting to look at those items so the governor can prepare that January budget proposal. So they provide information to the governor's office in coordination with the Department of Finance. Then the governor looks at this, the LAO's office is looking at this, um, Department of Finance is giving updates, and then the governor has the ability to you know, take this information and just accept it. He can modify um, pieces of it, he can reject pieces of it, but essentially he takes this information and then he proposes our spending plan that that we know as the January 10, you know, the January budget proposal, right? And then I've kind of already walked you through January through May. That's um, where the, the governor's budget goes to the legislature and all of those folks weigh in, Department of Finance, LAO, um, there's budget subcommittee hearings related to uh, education, social services, transportation, climate, you know, all the different areas. And so those subcommittee meetings happen and uh, that happens January through May. They submit another legislative, the legislature su submits a legislative budget proposal back to the governor. And then that's where he then takes in the information they've provided. He proposes the May, the May revision. Right. And then we go through that process again, like I mentioned, but in that abbreviated four week time frame. And um, and then that information comes back to the governor from the, the legislature. The governor then has a lot of um, opportunity here. He can sign the budget bill. And what I'll say is often what's been happening is there's been a lot of communication while the legislator, the legislature is evaluating that May revision. There is regular communication between the legislature and the governor, generally speaking, so that what the legislature sends back to the governor, it's ready to go. He's already aware of what's coming and he's gonna sign off on it. That's what we've been seeing in recent years. Now, in, in years past, we saw you know different things. That's kind of how stage three, you know, it got blue penciled. And, you know, kind of overnight, we lost our stage three funding. But the governor does have that uh, power, right? He can take a look at that May revise. He can blue, blue pencil things. He can make uh, some adjustments. He can't take away, but he can make some adjustments. Um, but um, any, 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 he can't increase also, he can't increase, um, he can actually take away, but what he can't do is increase. I, I said that backwards. So he can take away, but he can't increase above what the legislature's approved. Um, and then it, um, when he makes those adjustments, depending on what adjustments he makes, we'll talk about kind of in, in just a moment as we move to the legislature slide, we'll talk a little bit about their role in this. And then just keep in mind that this happens all somewhat simultaneously in coordination. <clears throat> so the legislature gets that January proposal, as we mentioned, and that January proposal, um, they start reviewing it. They go into budget committee hearings on both the assembly and the Senate side. They take information from the LAO's office, from the Department of Finance and the public. So, uh, you know, Justina in her new role here with Every Child California and part of our EC Voices Network, this year, earlier this year, during the budget process, she was at the budget hearings regularly providing testimony. Um, now, often for us and, and where we said you don't need to be an expert is that, generally speaking, 
someone, one of the experts comes in and testifies at those budget hearings for the legislature and they they share everything. And then typically what we do in a coordinated way at these hearings is some of our more experienced um, advocates, they go up and they speak first and they might be from a number of folks. They could be from CCRC, my organization. They could be from Every Child California. They could be from Head Start, Early Edge, you know, uh, Children Now, a number of folks. And they share briefly 20 seconds why they support this or don't support these pieces of the budget. And then the rest of us, we've already had conversations and we know we're in alignment. Then it's easy for us to say, my name is James Moses. I'm from Child Care Resource Center. I am in support of these aspects of the budget bill, as mentioned by Justina Arpelding from Child Care, uh, from Every Child California, or as mentioned by um, Jackie Wong from First Five California. So we're able to kind of just do, we call those Me Too's. They're the Me Too budget asks. So that happens, as I mentioned, from January uh, to May. And then um, it is important to note that one of the changes that happened quite a few years back is now, uh, based on Prop 25, the, the Assembly and Senate, the legislature only needs a simple majority to pass their budget. So in years past, we used to have two thirds, which created a real challenge um, a lot of times. Um, it probably wouldn't be as much of a challenge now because we, generally speaking, have more than two thirds of our legislature is all from the same party. So we probably still could meet the two thirds. But going back 15 years ago, uh, having two thirds of the budget uh, to, to pass the I mean, two thirds of the legislature to pass the budget was very difficult. Um, now, there are other pieces of legislation budget where we do need two thirds um uh vote to to pass and um if we're going to override anything that the governor's vetoed on a budget bill or an appropriation that's that's an area where we certainly need two thirds of our um of our legislature to vote on that okay so um where are we at what slide are we on right now justina which one is this so this is how we you can start to advocate. Uh, so you can start as early as the fall. Okay. And this slide 16, right? Six, 16, yes. Okay. So um, so this is really, yeah, as, as Justina just mentioned, this is kind of where what we want to share with you so you understand a little bit more about how you can have your voice heard when and where you have opportunities to share, right? So um, the fall, this is, this is one of the best times for us to connect with our legislators in their local offices and start to share our voice about what's important and what our needs are, especially as they relate to a budget um, so that they're prepared for that in January. So legislatures have been in their home offices since October and they don't go back until January. Um, if you get connected, what I would recommend is get connected to the legislatures, the legislators that serve you and the area you, you work in, and you'll get notices. So tonight I'm participating, as soon as I leave here, I'm participating with Senator Ochoa Bogue in a town hall event. Um, in two days after that, on, on Thursday, I'm participating with Assembly Member Reyes in a town hall event. So our legislators are hosting events and attending events all through the fall here because they're back in the offices. And this is a great time to engage with them, share with them, talk to them. It's a great time to invite them to your, to your center, your family child care program, share with them what your budget needs are, what challenges you're facing. So this is a great time um, to do that. So you can make appointments with them or you can go to events. I think one of the, I enjoy going to events, although I do make appointments with them often. I enjoy going to their events because it shares with them that I'm interested in them. I'm interested in what's important to them and I'm interested in supporting them. 
And generally speaking, if we are supportive of them, they they have a desire to be supportive of us. So um, it's really important to, to get connected to the legislators and more importantly, to their staff. And we talked about the budget um, subcommittees and such, you know, right now is a off, this is the off season for them. So this is a good time to go to the website and look up the assembly budget committee or the assembly education subcommittee and see who the legislators are that are part of that subcommittee. You can also see for every subcommittee, there's legislative staff. They have consultant staff that work in that subcommittee. And then you can you can make phone calls, send emails, get connected to that staff and start communicating with the, that, those staff members to start to have our voice heard, um, you know, with education or human services staff ahead of time. So that's critical to kind of create those relationships. And we'll move to the next slide, Justina. Um, so I think a lot of this here is stuff I've already really talked to you about. So I'm not going to go in detail. You'll have this slide, but this really kind of talks uh, you through the process of what happens after the governor releases it. Um, all those subcommittee hearings I talked about, this just kind of goes through that again in, in a little more detail about that. So I don't think there's anything in there that I haven't um, touched base with you you on right now, right? Um, so this information that you're seeing here, um, this is some of the information, this is from our most recent budget though, correct, Justina? Yeah. And so the information we shared when we gave you all the summary information, that was from 21-22. This information right here is for the budget that we're currently in 23-24. And so we had we had some really big wins this year. Um, we had you know two point eight billion dollars related to childcare rates, um, and so we saw the reimbursement rates in, increase. We saw a, a commitment to creating a single reimbursement rate and creating a new structure that's no longer based on the regional market rate, but based on um, the cost of quality care. So. Big, big infusion of funding for rates. Family fees were, were connected to that uh, as well. So a big pot of funding came there along with UPK funding that was both on the state preschool side as well as the transitional kindergarten side. So a lot of funding there. And you can see there's lots of budget summaries out there for 23-24. So we'll get you connected to those to give you a little more detail. Um, I think the last thing on this slide that we just want to point out is that a, a few years ago, the governor made an overall commitment to increase child care spaces by 200,000. And he began to provide those increases. And um, in recent years, he started to look at how he might um, delay some of those for a variety of reasons. One is concerns over funding funding revenues, but then also concerns of, are we expending the funding that we've already put out there? Um, right now, they want to delay uh, slots. I think it's about 30,000. They want to delay those slots for one more year. Um, and their rationale is we're not, we're not serving the children we've already received funding for, so why, why should we get more? But um, for a lot of agencies, the uptake was slow in the beginning because they gave us a whole bunch of money at one time and they gave it to us like six months late, if you will. And so the uptake was kind of slow. But now that uh, agencies have really gotten on top of that, we're now seeing that funding get um, expended quickly. I know here at CCRC, we, we, we had a waiting list of more than 30,000 children. We fully emptied that waiting list with all that funding. And it said it took a little while, but then we got going. We fully expended it. Now we have 9,000 children on the wait list. So this is an area where a lot of folks are advocating that he um, puts that money back into our budget. So we'll take a look at the next slide that talks a little bit about, um, you know, to give you a little bit more, more tips on this. Um, so um, 
you know, when we're advocating around the budget, especially in years like we're in right now, where suddenly we're really concerned about the revenues, we think the revenues are going to fall significantly short of what was um, anticipated, then it's a little bit harder to advocate and to have budget wins, if you will. So what you one of the things you really want to do is take a look at who are all the different partners out there that are aligned with you? Who can we advocate together with that they're asking for they're asking for money, but for the same areas that we're asking for money. So then we bring those partners together, we advocate together. It's helpful for us to consider um, you know, what are the challenges that we that we need funding for? What problems does this solve if we get the, this funding? What difference does that make in the communities of your legislators to really analyze that? And um, a lot of times, if you can provide them with data and infographics that show um, how, you know, like in San Bernardino County, where I'm at, we know that while the state says we only have enough child care funding for one in every eight children that are eligible. In many parts of San Bernardino County, we have funding for one child for every 12 to 15 children. So we're even in a more dire um, need than the state average. So then we really want to emphasize that with state legislators, why this funding is so important and so critical to San Bernardino County and why we need to make sure that funding is um Funding is put out in the areas of the greatest need and not necessarily based on population alone, for example. So it's really important to understand how you can um, how you can demonstrate the need in your areas and how you can use that funding. And then we want to be sure that when we do get funding, we go back to the legislature, we say thank you and we show them how successful um, that that funding was. We also want to think about um, some of sometimes there's special funding that can be utilized for some of our issues, and we want to make sure that we understand what those things are. So it's important for us to be well informed. And as I mentioned, Justina will have a lot of information for you as 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 we finish this. We'll be providing a, a, an update to all of you and get you connected to all those resources that can help you. And then, of course, we're a resource for you as well um, related to this. So um, I think I've kind of talked about a lot of the things that you see here on this slide, right? You know, really about partnering with other organizations. Really, um, you know, Every Child California is, is a huge um, advocacy group in, in our state from the, uh, on the ECE th side of things. They're part of the ECE coalition. Now that we have this Voices Network, it's an it's an amazing space for us to grow advocates and really um, start to communicate in unison um, with our legislators. So, and you know, what we're ultimately hoping is over time, the CC Voices Network will kind of become a community of voice, uh, community of voices, or a community practice, um, kind of a place where we get together and we talk about what's worked in certain areas, how we've communicated. Um, how we might duplicate that communication or duplicate that advocacy um, activity in, in the communities we live in to see, see if we can gain traction from some of those areas. Um, it's really important for us not only to know who our partners are and, and what each partner wants out of a funding us, but it's also important to know who the opposition is and why they might oppose. Because sometimes, um, sometimes a, someone who's in opposition really is a supporter and we just need to 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 let them see it that way um, an example of that is recently we worked on a developmental screening bill and you can move to the next slide um justina but we worked on a developmental screening uh bill and the goal of this bill is to ensure that all children zero to five are screened with a developmental screening tool and pediatricians agree with this as well but initially, they had concerns about our bill, not that they disagree with children being screened, but they don't want to lose the money because pediatricians can draw down that funding for doing a screening for Medi-Cal providers. So they don't want to lose that funding opportunity. So then it's a matter of, 
okay, how do we work through this challenge? Because we ultimately, we both want the same thing, but we each have a little bit different angle on it. How do we talk about those angles so we can come together with one ask that benefits children and families? That's what we're trying to benefit, but doesn't hurt um, any of the, the organizations as well. Are we going to do that poll, Justina? See, we have about 15 minutes left. Let's skip it and go. The rest of this is going to be kind of just an overview of everything that we've discussed so that you have these um, these slides to reflect on and go back and see if you're like, what was that timeline again? Um, so that's okay. what the rest of this is. So, so summer to fall, you know, um, we were just in that, you know, we're now in the fall, but we were just in this. We just came through this, right? Um so um, the, the, the budget gets approved and then there's a lot of uh, budget, budget bill juniors. There's also a lot of trailer bills that really um, define exactly how the budget's gonna be um, come down through the departments and ultimately into the communities. So state departments and the agencies that receive that money are spending a lot of time in this time understanding what their budget is, how much money they're actually going to receive, how they have to utilize this funding, what target areas it goes into. And, and um, at the state level, then they begin to prepare those documents to go back with the Department of Finance to prepare future budgets, right? And like I said, we did kind of go over this. Um, there'll be meetings with the governor's team with Department of Finance, and they'll, they're in that process of uh, now that we know what the 23-24 budget is, summer to fall, they start planning for the 24-25 budget. Um, and they start to really think about, you know, what's the governor, what's on the governor's mind? What does he want? What are we experiencing in our departments? What are the legislature talking to us about? What are we talking to, to them about? So we can start to create the, the budget that we will submit in to the governor's office so he can prepare for the January budget. Okay. Um, so the next slide, we have really, I think we've gone over this um, quite a bit. So I'm, uh, I'm not gonna go too much into this. I'm gonna let that go because I think we've covered it really, really well. But if you have questions on it, for sure, um, let us know. You know, we talked about the June 15th date. Um, I think that's on the slide that she, that Justina just moved through through, but July 1st, we talked about how that's the new, the new budget year of the beginning. And then of course, once that budget's passed, we we iron out exactly how it gets expended, how it gets passed down through the state departments to the agencies that are serving the communities. And then we kind of start this process all over again. Um, okay, budget bills versus policy bills, right? So um, many of you may know this, but policy bills really, they create new laws, new regulations. Um, uh, we use a term where we say they often codify things. So they put things into code. Um, so that's the what a policy bill does. Policy bills are heard through the legislature's policy bill process. So it's somewhat similar, but uh, instead of budget subcommittees, you have um, more, more of a programmatic and, and legislative focus, but you also have an assembly education committee, a hum, assembly human services. So all the same budget subcommittees, you have the same subcommittees on the legislative policy side of things um, so that we can look to change law create new regulations, new, new codes um, that we adhere our programs to for the benefit of children and families in our communities, right? And often in these policy bills, the budget connection to those is they're looking at these policy bills to determine what kind of a budget cost there is to them. And, and if, if there's a budget cost, they often get um, caught up in appropriations and then they struggle to move through appropriations. And what we've seen in recent years that we, we have a policy bill and a corresponding budget ask at the same time. So that's, that's somewhat new, but I would say the last five, six years, that's gained a lot of popularity, right? 
Um, the budget bill is really designed to give authority to how we how we use money for public services. We've kind of outlined this a little bit. We've talked about how it moves through the budget committees. And then um, what we haven't talked a whole lot about is that we have that main budget that is signed by the governor, usually by June 30th. But following that primary budget, we have what we call budget bill juniors that generally follow, not every year, but generally every year. And then we also have a lot of trailer bill language. So these are bills that really start to further define how we're going to use the money that was um, that was outlined in the budget proposal or the, the final budget, how we're going to utilize that, how we're going to expend it, um, when it's going to be expended. It kind of starts to lay out the requirements of, of agencies and such of how they have to spend it and utilize it. Okay. Um, I, oh, there we go. That helps. Okay, so the um, this is just kind of gives you a little bit of some of the definitions of um, some of the uh, budget related items that you'll see here. Right. So this is gets you connected to the assembly uh, and senate budget committees and their fiscal review committees. What that means. What the budget act is. So some of those things I've talked about. Um, this just further defines that. I'm not going to go into those in too much detail because I do want to have a little bit of time for a question or two. If you have questions that we haven't addressed, you want to take us to the next one? Just yes. So this next one, just these, these definitions here. And then um, right now you can go into to Q and A if anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask James some questions. He's a great resource. So it's a wonderful time to take advantage of having him here to, to ask some questions. And next week, we'll go more into trailer bills and how they work as well. Looks like- Hi, yep, go I ahead. have a question. Hey, go James. Um, so as we're thinking about this and preparing for um, the next budget year, and like you mentioned, is the right time to meet with our local assembly members um, or legislators or representatives, what are some are some good points to bring across, especially um, since we're a nationwide nonprofit organization, but we're doing work locally, what are some, uh, some points to bring or how could we prepare to better support the county and support the community that we're targeting in the girl then uh, we would wanna see more funding come to this county. So um, thanks, Andrea. I, I think um, that could be a little bit different for each of you based on the counties or the regions and areas you're working in, right? Um, so Andrea is working in uh, Riverside County, which is a neighboring county to San Bernardino County. I would say, you know, at a statewide level, uh, there's a couple of things really related to the budget that are really important to us right now that'll probably be rise to the priorities, but we're still in the process of defining that. But I think ensuring that all of the budget increases that we saw this year, ensuring that we see those budget increases through, that we really, that those rate increases stay intact and continue moving forward, that we continue to see rate increases that keep up with the, the, the cost of, of what it takes to provide quality care. I think ensuring that families, especially our low-income families, you know, continue to receive um, low-cost options, so keeping those family fees down. Um, I think ensuring that um, we have the teachers necessary to maintain. I think that's going to come up as a perhaps a, a budget ask related to our staffing crisis that we're in. Um, I think other things that could come up in different places, um, you know, work around infrastructure could come up, right? We were, I guess it's maybe been four years, five years ago, there was $250 million. You probably know this better than I do, Andrew, but I think there was $250 million put into the budget for infrastructure. Um, I think it was initially $200 million of that was pulled back because uh, to use for the, 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 during COVID and, a lot of that money didn't come back out. So I think in some areas, uh, infrastructure um, 
infrastructure funding is critical. Um, you know, in many in many places we have a, a a child care desert. We use that term, but I would say that there's not too many places in California that don't have that desert. So, in you know, creating opportunities for small family child cares to become large, creating opportunities for the large family child care providers to open child care centers for those that want to make those expansion. I think in some areas that's um, that's critical. So I think we're going to see that change. I know for us here in, in San Bernardino County, we're talking a lot about um, just the staffing crisis, supporting programs in general. You know, if we didn't have Hold Harmless right now for early childhood providers, um, I, I think we might see a lot of our programs really str struggling even more than they're struggling now. You know, right now we have empty classrooms because we don't have teachers. We have children on a waiting list that want to come in and be be educated, but we don't have teachers to teach. So I think that's a big a big part of the ask. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Anyone welcome. else have any questions for James? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't have, I guess it's not really a question, but we have to be aware that some of these provisions this year will expire in June of 25. And so, sorry, I don't know how I look this time of day. But anyway, <laughs> um, they will expire and how we can keep them going. And so it may not affect this budget, but it has to be for up in everybody's mind that these are going to expire. And if they do, like James said, and we don't get um, the whole harmless continued, see, um, lots of people going out of business. Yeah, I, I think, like I said, that's probably one of the top asks right now, or not asks, but top um, talking points is really to help them understand the importance of uh, continuing the, the enactment of, of funding that they've provided over the last two to four years um, to not just keep us afloat. It need, We need to move our funding from keeping us afloat to um to using the funding to create a, a sustainable system because right now our system is not sustainable that's why we have closed classrooms right um so i think a, a big part of the discussion is how do we create funding that allows us to become really sustainable programs where mm -hmm. uh, we pay teachers enough money that they want to come in and work for us that they can make more money teaching in a classroom than they can working, you know, in fast food or retail. Um, and of course, now the health workers are going to move up to $25 an hour. That that we may see that impact our um, our industry and our field as well. So I I think really helping them understand that we we need the funding you've given us, but we need some additional funding and supports to really um make adjustments to the system to allow it to be a sustainable system that benefit children and families for years to come. Yeah, and to piggyback on to James, um, <clears throat> because we have term limits in our legislator, in our legislative houses in Sacramento, we have to be in a constant mode of re-education and educating the new ones and, re and continuing to educate those who've been in our houses of um in up in the legislators about the needs of early child care. And the other piece is that to as we talk about it is to talk about it and how it affects the uh economy in general, the workforce, people being able to go to work. But <clears throat> we our our job keeps going on and on because people turn out. Yeah. And they, we have to start all over again with new folks <laughs> and we don't know how much they know when they come aboard. Yeah. Well, thank you, Joyce. Appreciate those comments. And I, I do see we're at six o'clock. And so Justina, I, I, I'm not sure how you want to close this out. I think we want to make sure that folks know how to reach us. And uh, mm -hmm. there's an email address there um, 
that will connect you with Justina. And then Justina has, you know, she's a wealth of information herself, but she also has a team around her that's a wealth of information. So we, you know, if you have additional questions, reach out. And then you can see here, um, you know, we're hoping to reconnect with all of you, but many others on November 28th, where we'll kind of talk about the second part of, of budget um, and trailer bills. We'll talk a little more about trailer bills and budget bill juniors and, and things of that nature. And I want to thank James for sharing your experience and your wisdom with us tonight. And thank you all of you for joining us. I know that you have very busy schedules, so we appreciate you being here. You'll receive a follow-up email with a link to the resources where, where you'll have access to the slides and also the video. Um, remember that if this does seem overwhelming, please, like James said, join um, ECE Voices. It's free for you to join. You'll have access to all these resources. We'll break down the budget for you. We'll give you the summaries. We'll get you connected with lead advocates so that you're sharing all of this information and work with others um, so that it doesn't feel so overwhelming and we can make a difference for the ECE community. So thank you all very much for joining us tonight. We look forward to seeing you on the 28th. Bye all. Thank you. Great evening.